started a series a couple weeks ago, and it's called The Cost of Loving You. The first week, we talked about how Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, and we know as scriptures teach us, we're no longer slaves to sin. Sin is no longer our master, but Jesus is our master, and that is good news, amen? I'd rather belong to him than belong to sin. And so Jesus has set us free, and so that's one of the, 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 the cost of loving you. He had to lay down his life. Tonight, I want to talk about the cost of loving you, and the cost of loving and you, uh, Jesus loves us so much that he made his peace available to us. And peace is a good thing. And we're going to look at what peace is, and we're going to look at how it's a weapon for us. Uh, so I want to start here, John 14, 27, out of the NIV. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I really like that. We don't have to be troubled, and we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because we have peace. And what I want you guys to know about this peace, lots of times when we think about peace, we think tranquility. Tranquility and peace are not the same thing. When I think about being tranquil, I think of like, man, when I was in India, India has like 5,000 different gods. And they've got like temples set up on every corner. And a lot of these temples that as you're walking around the streets of India, you'll see these temples. And inside these temples, they have like these shrines with candles and petals, flower petals. And inside a lot of them, they have this golden statue. And he's sitting there. All I remember, if you guys, oh, man, is anyone else in here totally creeped out by belly buttons? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There used to be this commercial on TV, and it had the belly button singing. I would get weak when that commercial would come on. It was just the worst thing ever. And what I remember the most about these temples in India is it had this really large guy that was made of gold, and he's sitting there cross-legged, and he has his fingers up like this, and his belly button was huge. And I was just like, ugh, I can't even, like, worship that, <laughs> you know, not only because it's a fake god, it's an idol, but because it has a weird belly button. I'm just, I believe that my god has a perfect belly button, whatever that looks like, I don't know. But they had these statues, and it's so interesting, like, this is what a lot of people think peace is. They think peace is tranquility. There's no power in tranquility. Tranquility is like meditation, quiet, soft, you know. <clears throat> if you ever go by a stream, somebody might say, ooh, that stream is so tranquil. It's so like, and you know, I think of like little baby statues with like arrows and like, ah, like that's tranquility, you know. But God's peace is not tranquility. God's peace is powerful. Someone say powerful. And so I need you to understand there's nothing wrong with tranquility. It's nothing wrong to have that kind of peace. There's nothing wrong with having like that calm in your lives. But I want the power of God in my life. And one way God's power works in my life is through peace because peace is a weapon that has been given to us, the believers. So we don't have to be troubled as the world is troubled. We don't have to be afraid as the world is afraid because we have peace. Now, what was the cost to give us this peace? Isaiah 53, 5, it says this out of the NIV, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Man, look at the terminology of scriptures, guys. Sometimes we read scriptures and we really don't take a moment just to think about what it's describing. He was pierced. Now, when you think about piercing, you think about maybe someone getting their ears pierced. I don't know how y'all do that. I would pass out. I'm not that strong. But Jesus just didn't have his ears pierced. His whole body was pierced for us. And his, when, when we see pictures of him hanging on the cross, those nails, lots of times we think it went through his hands. But the truth is, is those bones in his hands aren't strong enough to hold him on the cross. They had to go through the bone in his wrist to hold him on the cross. And so he was pierced, nails, and it's not like little baby nails. These are long, giant nails that went through the bone, in between the bone of his wrist, to, so he could hang on that cross and slowly suffocate on his own blood as his lungs filled up with blood from being pierced for our transgressions. The Bible talks about the cat of nine tails that gave him 39 straps or stripes on his back. And, and I, I read this study a long time ago, and it said that every disease in the world falls underneath the 39 different categories. It's so interesting that Jesus took 39 stripes on his back, and then there's 39 categories into which the governments of the world classify and identify diseases. And they took that cat of nine tails, and they whipped him. 
and it didn't just, it wasn't just like a whip, you know this, but like from the shards of glass and stone that were on the cat of nine tails, every time that Roman soldier hit him and then pulled it back, his flesh was ripped from his body with it. This is the cost of loving us. And I think sometimes we don't love Jesus the way he deserves to be loved because we really don't understand the price that he paid to first love us. The Bible says that when we were unlovely, he loved us. So what does that mean? When I was gross and covered in my sin, the death that I should have died, Jesus decided to die for it. It's that revelation that makes me love him so much. And as I read these scriptures... I ask the Holy Spirit, give me perspective of what my Savior really went through. He was beaten so bad that his own mother couldn't recognize him, that he couldn't even carry the cross up to that hill behind, beside himself because he had no energy left. Somebody had to help him. This is the cost of loving you and the cost of loving me. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. Do y'all hear that? When I think about crushed, I think about ants running around. And what do I usually do? I just, I was back in this ready room, and this giant spider took off, darted across the floor. And I just, the first thing I did is I shrieked. I was like, ah! You know, I was like, oh my gosh, it scared me. And then after I got my composure, the next thing I did is I crushed it. Freaked me out at first, but then I crushed it. I obliterated it, nothing left. It was just a pancake on the floor and it's still there because I'm not touching it. Someone's gonna have to get it with a mop tomorrow. I don't know. But that's what happened to Jesus. They crushed him. As he laid down and he gave his back, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Someone say peace. So it took somebody getting punished to bring you peace. One translation says the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. He was punished so I don't have to be afraid. He was punished so I don't have to be troubled. This is the cost of loving us. This is the cost. This is what it took Jesus to provide you and provide me with peace. Over in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, out of the Amplified, it says the peace of God that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. So we have this peace that acts as a guard over our hearts and over our minds. We have this peace that watches over us, and I really like this. When, when you really trust in the peace of God, it says it transcends your understanding. So what does that mean? God's peace will take you places that your mind cannot understand. When everything in your mind looks like chaos, and how am I gonna get from point A to point B, and you can't make sense of it up here, but yet you've got the peace of God on the inside of you, and that's what allows you to walk by faith because you know everything's gonna work out. I've got peace, and that peace will literally transcend send you from point A to point B, and you didn't get there by following your mind. You got there by following peace. Listen, friends, God, I'm going to help somebody real quick. Lots of people ask me this, especially young people, how am I led by God? Simple answer. Yes, Romans 8, 14 says the children of God are led by the Spirit of God, but here's the simple answer. God is peace, and if there's no peace in it, then God's not in it. Let me help you all with relationships. Rachel and I's relationship, 99.99999% of the time, it has peace. Yes, because we're human. There's times where we will have arguments, and they, my wife can testify. She's sitting back there in the back row. I, I bet you, how many years we've been married, boo? Uh, 17. All right, see, she didn't know either. So before you all throw stones at me, it's just not something we keep track of. But out of our 17 years, I bet you we've probably had three bad fights. I'm serious. And we are, e thank you, Chandler. Yes, sir. Chandler said it's because they're equally yoked, and I believe that. I distinctly, I'll just tell myself, I distinctly remember one bad fight, and it's while our house was being built. So we were living in someone else's house, and it was very, very hot. We didn't have a lot of AC. Rachel was pregnant with Christian. She was getting ready to explode. And because just there was a lot of stuff going on, and things did not go well with that night, and I actually took a break. I went for a jog. And then I came back, and we made up, and it was fine. You know, but that's happened three times in our entire life, 17 years. Why? 
because it's a relationship that's centered around God and because it's centered, listen, come on, it doesn't take two half people to make one whole relationship. It takes two whole people that make one whole relationship. And so the male and the female, they must be whole in God because only God can make you whole. Ooh, this is real good. Only God can make you whole. And when God, because the Bible says Jesus is the healer of the brokenhearted. If you have broken emotions, a person cannot heal that. No relationship, earthly relationship is going to mend that, is going to fix that. It's your heavenly relationship that fixes that. And when you allow God to make you whole, now you can get into a relationship and those two whole people can make a wonderful, they can be equally yoked. Thank you, Chandler. And they can have a beautiful relationship. But one reason why Rachel and I don't ever fight is because we were brought together in peace because God brought us together. And God is peace. If you have a relationship right now and it has more fighting, more vexing, and it's more troubling than it has peace, it's not a healthy relationship for you. And you need to take a step back and say, this isn't right. Amen? And so when we follow that peace, it protects us. Now watch how powerful this peace is. Over here in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I'm not over that, Chan, because they're equally yoked. Yes, sir. One day, now we're starting verse 35 out of the English Standard Version. I love it. One day, we can, anyways. All right. <laughs> On that day, when evening had come, do you all know what it means to be yoked together? It talks about a yoke that goes over an ox's neck. And you'll put one on one ox and one on the other ox, and they have, to, they have to work together in order to pull that plow. And so if you're unequally yoked, what's going to happen is one person's going to be doing more work than the other person, and they're going to grow weary, and then it's, it's going to fall apart. When the Bible says be equally yoked, lots of times it's talking about, when it's talking about people, yeah, you, you started something, bro. But when, it, it'll, it will fall up. You want to preach? Come on up here, man. Let me give you a microphone. Where's the mic? Come on up here, Chandler. What are you doing? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> one last thought get him up here the anointed Maya is like Lord no <laughs> when, the, when the Bible says <laughs> when the Bible says don't be unequally yoked you'll hear ministers talk about it and lots of times this is true guys if you are a Bible believing Christian you ought not be in a relationship, when I'm talking about relationship intimacy, with somebody who's not a Bible-believing person. You ought not date somebody who's not born again. Amen. That's just the, that's as simple as that. Amen. And a lot of people that are born again, you ought not date them either because they're, they're just a whole hot mess anyways, right? And so we cannot be unequally yoked because it will not work, all right? So here's this scripture. On that day, Mark 4, 35 through 41, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side, that's Jesus speaking, and leaving the crowd, they took with them in a boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him, verse 37, and a great windstorm arose. The waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filled. Like, this is, if you want to know what my nightmare is right here this is it I don't Rachel and I went on a cruise one time I had so much anxiety and I know I have peace of God I know I have faith so much anxiety because I'm like I can't see land and that does not help me and if a boat starts filling up with water and I can't see land yo I've seen the Titanic I know the end of this story I'm gonna give her a board that's big enough for both of us and I'm dying I mean it's just gonna be weird it's not gonna work out and so this is this is this is a nightmare right now what's happening and it says that their boat is filling up with water. But, but he was at the stern, who see Jesus, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Now look at this. Jesus, we're going to look at this scripture in a moment, who is peace. He's the prince of peace. What was he doing in the middle of the storm? He's sleeping. Because this is what peace does. Peace knows it's going to be all right. Peace knows it's going to be Okay. Don't you care that we're perishing, verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Now watch this. He said, peace, be still. This is why I said peace is not tranquility, not tranquility, because you need to see the peace of God in your life as a powerful force. The only reason when Jesus said, peace, be still, that peace was able to calm the storm, the only reason this works is peace has to be greater than the storm. If peace is not greater than the storm, then peace cannot calm the storm. 
But in your life and in my life, peace, because Jesus is the Prince of Peace and God is a God of peace, peace represents him, and he is greater than any storm that you ever face. So the peace that Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you, what he's saying is, I'm leaving you a powerful source that is greater than any storm you're going to come up against. And because it's more powerful than any storm, you never have to be troubled and you never have to be afraid. Because just like Jesus, who has all authority in all three realms, he delegated that authority to you, which means you have the ability to speak to storms. And just like he stood up on the stern of the boat and said, peace be still, when something comes up, when a storm arises in your life with the authority of Jesus, you can look at it by faith. You can say what? Peace be still. And what's so good is it has to listen. Because that peace is more powerful than the storm, right? He said, peace be still. Now, I like this. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The wind ceased, and there's a great calm. And so that peace is powerful. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus is telling us, you're going to have some troubles in this world, but take heart, it's going to be okay because I left you peace. And that peace is powerful. Now, this is the last thing I want to talk to you about tonight, guys. Don't let anything steal that peace. <clears throat> Don't let anything steal that peace. I was reading the book of John, and this is so interesting. Did you know that Jesus, he's such a cool dude, and I, I'm so grateful, but you know his 12 disciples? One of them in the book of John, he, you remember the, the lady brought that perfume and she poured it out on Jesus, and then Judas starts freaking out, and he said, why did she pour that on Jesus? That was a year's worth of wages. We could have sold it and fed the poor. And then John says this, don't listen to Judas. He's a thief anyways. He's over the treasury, the bag, the offering, and oftentimes he takes offering out of that and puts it in his own pocket. So Judas, while he was traveling with Jesus, he was a thief, Right? Now watch this. Don't let anyone steal your peace. When the rubber met the road and Jesus came into extreme circumstances, I'll list three for you real quick. When he went up and he was on the mountain and he was transfigured, we call that the transfiguration, right? When he went to Jairus' house and healed the daughter, when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he left the other disciples and he only took three with him, Peter, James, and John. Because in those situations, he knew, I can't have a thief with me when I need something powerful to happen. I can't let somebody steal me. Now, this is so cool. Jesus, he's all-knowing, right? He's he's omniscience. He has all knowledge because he's all God and he's all man. So he knew that Judas was stealing, but yet he still let Judas be in his company. That should minister to us, right? We, we, We can let worldly people in our lives. We just don't let worldly people close to us. He let Judas into his life, and he didn't call Judas out. He didn't shun Judas. He didn't throw rocks at him. But when the rubber met the road and he needed people there to support him, he took three people he could trust with him. And he kept Judas. I need to go heal a man's daughter who's dead. I'm not taking a thief with me. I need good faith. I'm going to take people, when I'm up on the mountain and I'm being transfigured and then Elijah shows up and Moses shows up and Peter's like, we're staying right here, let's build a tabernacle. And Jesus is like, no, we got to go down, I got to go to the cross. Jesus didn't take a lion thief with him, the one who was going to betray him. He didn't take Judas I Scarlet with him. He took the three he could trust. Listen, you need to have an inner circle. And I dare say this, I'm comfortable cutting everybody else out of my life that's going to steal stuff from me. I want people who are going to add to the quality of life that I'm called to live, not people who are going to steal. You need to protect peace. Someone say protect peace. peace. Now look at this, John 10, 10. It says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. The first thing he says the thief comes to do is what? Steal. And one thing we know he wants to steal is he wants to steal the word of God. The Bible says immediately when the, sword is, weed, when the word is sown, immediately the devil comes to steal the word that is sown. Why? Because the word of God always brings you peace. Right? And so the devil's coming to steal, and what he wants to steal is he wants to steal this relationship that you have with Jesus because he knows that relationship will produce peace. And there's many ways he'll do it. He'll do it through relationships. He'll do it through sin. He'll do it through stuff on the internet. He'll do it through stuff at parties. There's all sorts of ways. I saw this shirt many years ago. How many of y'all know who RG3 is? He used to be a quarterback in the NFL. He played for the Commanders, which are now the Commanders. He used to be the Washington Redskins. I saw him give a press conference one time, and he was wearing this shirt. Put that shirt up. It should be in there. Hopefully it's in there. 
The NFL, when he was at the podium giving his speech, actually made him turn this shirt inside out to finish his speech. Yeah, crazy. But I really like this. No Jesus, no peace. So if I know Jesus, then I'm going to know peace because Jesus is peace. But I like what's highlighted, no Jesus, no peace. So what does that mean? If I don't have Jesus, I don't have peace. If I know Jesus, I will know peace. But if I have no Jesus, I will have no peace. Now you can see why the world is so eager to steal your relationship with Jesus. Why the devil will use all different types of sin to sever this relationship. Because he knows when you know Jesus, you know peace. And so we have to protect this peace. We must make sure that everything we do, we keep peace around us. Now, listen to this scripture, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born. We, we use this scripture lots of times around Christmas time. For us to a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Listen, friends, you need to keep a close relationship with him. Don't let a boyfriend, girlfriend, a peer, something on the internet, an influencer, somebody on TikTok, somebody on Snapchat, don't let anybody on Instagram, Facebook, whatever uh, social media platform, don't let anybody talk you out of this relationship you have with Jesus. Listen to me, guys. This relationship you have with Jesus is being attacked like it's never been attacked before. All these influencers, Maybe all your friends at school, maybe even some of your parents or family members, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if we're not careful, they will try to talk us out of this relationship that we have with Jesus. And maybe not, it's not always doesn't come. A wolf does not always come cloaked as a wolf. Sometimes it comes as a sheep. And there's many different ways for a sheep, right, a wolf in sheep's clothing to steal this relationship. You've got to be the protector of it. Proverbs 27, 17, lots of ways we protect this relationship, or this relationship with peace is by, listen, this is, this is so good. Lots of times the way we protect this relationship with peace is by protecting the relationships we have with each other. Choose these relationships wisely, and when you choose these relationships wisely, it'll help us protect this relationship. Look at this scripture, Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Now, I want to read the, uh, maybe it's in a different translation. Let me read it out of mine real quick. You guys doing okay? Someone say, I'll protect peace. <clears throat> this side did real good. This side over here didn't want to say nothing. Proverbs 27, 17. Out of the New Living Translation says this. As iron sharpens iron, I really like this, a friend sharpens a friend. Now I'm going to say something. I want you all to listen to it. If you have a friend and they're not sharpening you, uh, let me say it a better way. If you have a friend and they're not pushing you to be closer than God, then in biblical standards, that's not a friend. It's not a friend. Anybody who doesn't sharpen you is not a friend. I have this hatchet up here that I've had for a long time. Uh, it's really sharp, and this hatchet came with a sharpening stone. Uh, I was supposed to have silly putty with me today, but I couldn't find any silly putty. And so then I was going to use Play-Doh, but then I didn't, use, I didn't Play-Doh. But anytime I take this hatchet and I strike it against the sharpening stone, it's becoming better. Anytime I take this hatchet, as iron sharpens iron, so does a friend sharpen another. Every time I strike it against this sharpening stone, it's becoming better, right? But if I took this and I started to hit it against wood, started to hit it against concrete, I was going to take Play-Doh and put it on the blade because, or uh, uh, not, yeah, Play-Doh or what's that other silly putty? Because lots of times, and now listen, I'm all about shenanigans, but this is important. If I, was, if I had Play-Doh or silly putty and I put it on the blade, this blade wouldn't be as effective as it's supposed to be. So what does that mean? I can't have just a bunch of people in my life 
that are Plato, right? What's that other stuff? Silly, silly putty. Everybody at, at high school that's not, their life isn't centered, they're just doing a bunch of silly nonsense. And if you surround yourself with that silly nonsense, it's going to dull your blade. It's going to make your life not effective. And this is what everyone tells you. It's not a big deal. It's all right. And if we do that and we keep doing that, our blade becomes dull. And, and that's a problem because when our blade becomes dull, if this gets dull enough, it's no longer effective. Or you could say it this way, and this is what I want to get to. It's really important. If this blade becomes dull, this hatchet cannot fulfill its purpose. The devil wants to dull you so much spiritually that you'll never fulfill your purpose. And he'll throw all sorts of distractions your way to keep you from fulfilling your purpose. Now, it's senior high, so the easiest illustration I have is when it comes to something like sex before marriage. People will tell you it's not a big deal. It's just sex. But nothing will steal your purpose quicker than having a child outside of wedlock. And people just want to do a bunch of silly, it's no big deal, you're in high school, just sow your wild oats. Well, guess what? When you sow those wild oats, what happens when they take seed and they grow and they produce a harvest? See, no one wants to talk about that. I believe I'm looking at a bunch of teenage students that when it comes to the life you're living, you don't just want to sow your wild oats, but instead you want to sow the seed that God's asked you to sow. So when it grows and reaps or produces a harvest, that's a harvest you want to reap. Right? I don't want to reap a harvest off of my wild oats that I'm sowing that are outside the parameters of God's word. I want to sow seed that's going to make me better. I want to sow seed that I'm not afraid of the harvest when it comes knocking on my door. This is the kind of stuff that we have to think about. Because this stuff has been so watered down in the world. And we're going to do a, a series. The Lord put it on my heart. I'm just going to give you a, a quick uh, preview, a prelude, if you will. Not every relationship you have is supposed to be one of intimacy. This has gotten really confusing in our day and age. Just because we get close to someone doesn't mean we're supposed to be intimate with someone. Amen. God's called us to have divine, godly relationships. You look at John and, and, uh, and Jesus. They were extremely close. There's one scripture that talks about how John laid his head on the bosom of Jesus. But just because they were brothers and they were close, they were never intimate. Y'all understand what I'm saying? We have to have the relationships centered around God's word. And everything in God's word, listen, he gives us the parameters to where we're supposed to live by. So that way, everything we hit our life against, it makes it sharper. God wants you to have sex, and he wants you to, to enjoy the fruits of that, but it's all according to God's timing. And if it's not according to his timing, instead of making your life better, it'll make your life worse. Amen? We don't like to hear that, and you won't get a lot of churches and youth pastors that'll tell you that, but we don't shy away from the truth of God's word. He created us to enjoy certain things, but enjoying certain things outside of God's timing well, that's sin. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And the reason why the devil wants us to enjoy those things outside of God's timing is because he knows if we do that, it steals peace. And now we're losing something that's powerful in our life that Jesus was crushed to give us. That Jesus was whipped and beaten and wore a crown of thorns, and they just didn't place that crown on his head. They placed it on his head, and then they took wooden rods and beat it down into his skull. They ripped the beard from his face. Jesus suffered greatly. This is the cost of loving you, and he was happy to do it. The Bible says, with the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was looking beyond the cross, and he saw you. And this is what Jesus was thinking. I have to die to get them peace. I have to die to get them eternal life. I have to die to heal their bodies. I have to die to prosper them. And I'm willing to do it. Now listen, don't be like Esau. Don't give away your birthright. When you were born into this world, you were born with certain things that Jesus died to give you. Don't give them away for sin. Don't give away that peace 
because you want to be in a relationship. Don't give away that peace because you want to go to a party and do what everyone else is doing. Don't give, because when you give that away, you're giving away what Jesus was crushed and what he died to give you. And then this is what a lot of Christians do. They sell that peace for a moment in time. They sell that piece for 60 seconds of watching something on the internet. They sell that piece. They sell it, they sell it, they sell it. We, 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 we sell the piece to the world all the time. We sell it, we sell it. And then something comes up and we need peace. And guess what? You sold all of it. You, you got rid of all of it. One bad decision at a time. Jesus paid too high of a price want to say it, but I don't know if it's appropriate. <laughs> he paid too high of a price for me to sell this stuff to the world. I got to protect it. I got to protect it. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. Lord knows I'm not perfect. But every chance that I have an opportunity to make a decision, Lord, help me protect this. Let me protect peace because I need peace. I never know when a storm's going to come up. I never know when fear's going to be right there. I need your peace. I don't know when troubles are going to come. I need your peace. Let me protect it. And how do I protect it? One godly decision at a time. If you would, just close your eyes and bow your heads real quick. This is my challenge to you guys. Examine your lives. Look at your lives and say, is there anything that's still in peace? Jesus died a miserable death to give me this powerful weapon called peace. Let's be honest with ourselves and examine our lives. Is there anything I'm doing that's stealing it? Am I selling it piece by piece for pleasures of this world? No one is here to judge. The Bible says, judge yourselves lest you be judged. I'm asking you, evaluate your life. I want you to love me the way Jesus loved me, and I know you want me to love you the way Jesus loved you. So we're never going to throw stones at each other. We're only going to love one another and support each other. But what I want us to do is look at our own lives and say, what do I need to change to be better at protecting this peace, this powerful force that Jesus gave me. What do I need to do? Father God, I ask that you'd help every single one of us. If there's something right in front of us that is still in peace, I ask for the boldness and the confidence to do what is right. Let us not give in to these desires of the flesh. Let us not give in to what the world says is okay. Let us not give in. Let us live according to the standard of the truth of God's word. Let us not shy away from it. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. But you will take care of us if we will stick with you. And just like you said, sin is enjoyable for a season, but it's fleeting and the wages of it are always death. So let us step back and recognize it for what it is. It's a counterfeit. And so we choose to walk away from the counterfeit and walk towards the real. We make a decision, a hard choice inside of us right now. I know we're not going to be perfect, but we make a decision to just take a step towards you. I ask you that you'd help them, Father God, every single one of us, be more committed in this relationship that we have with you. If we have to cut out some friends, let us cut out some friends. If we have to end some relationships, let us end relationships. If we have to remove some stuff from our phone, let us remove it. Whatever we have to do, let us preserve this relationship with you at all costs because with this relationship comes peace. So we determine in our own hearts not to do what is easy, but to do what is right. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.